Hi, this is Maria Olson. You may know me from Trophy Heads or Starry Eyes and maybe Paranormal Activity 3. And I want to welcome you to Anthony T's Horror Show because it's an awesome show. Hi, my name is Jessica Cameron and you're listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Hey, fellow horror fans. This is Troy Escamilla, the director of Party Night and Mrs. Claus. And you are listening to Anthony T's Horror Show. Enjoy. Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm Anthony T. This edition is loaded. As yes, I will not be having any news this episode. Because, yes, you can all thank Jason Blum. Because his production company, Blumhouse, have really done it this time. By ruining a classic horror film. I'm talking about Black Christmas, which comes out on December 13th, and yours truly will not be there to see that film because, well, the trailer sucks, and I got some news about the film's rating, which also really irks me. I'll have that on this episode. I'll also have an interview with founder and developer of the Slasher app, Damon Della Greca, as we talk about his new app, Slasher, which is, I think, a great horror app. I highly recommend everyone download that app on your phone if you're a huge lover of horror, like I am, because it is just Facebook for horror fans, without all the drama and the you-know-what. I'll have that interview. But first, since I can't get to any news, because, well, Jason Blum and his upcoming remake of Black Christmas in which he produced spawned not one segment, but two segments. So there's no news this episode. Sorry, don't blame me. Blame Jason Blum because there's two things that I'm really upset about this Black Christmas remake, but I figured I'll divide it into two segments. So I have to cut the news. Sorry, don't blame me. Blame Jason Blum and his team at Blumhouse because this Remake of Black Christmas looks like crap. And it even looks more like crap with its recent rating from the MPAA. But first, let me just throw up the commentary disclaimer. As you're probably going to hear this twice this episode. Because I got two commentaries on Black Christmas. Don't blame me again. Blame Jason Blum. For hijacking my show again. Warning. The following commentary doesn't represent the views of Doc Discussions or the Doc Discussions Network. In other words, there are my views, my views only. Now, I have a rant that I have been waiting for a very long time to get. In fact, pretty much been waiting to talk about this for like over a month now. But with all the Rock and Chalk coverage and had another episode in the can, it was very hard to get to this rant because, well, I told you I was going to be ranting about this back a month ago and I've not had the time to do it. But now I have the time to do it. So it really needs to get out of my system because really it is about The most talked about topic on the show, you guessed it, Jason Blum and Blumhouse. And yes, I'm talking about their upcoming sort of remake, even though yours truly doesn't think it's a remake. I'll get to that in a second, of Black Christmas. 
This is the second time that the original 1974 movie Black Christmas is getting remade. It was first remade back in 2006. Now, 13 years later, it's getting remade again. And this time, it may not even be a remake of Black Christmas. As that trailer really doesn't look like a remake of the original Black Christmas. Because, first of all, I don't remember a cult. In the original Black Christmas, I remember a killer stalking a sorority, but I never remembered a cult in that film. In fact, I'm almost 100% positive that there was no cult in the original Black Christmas. Yes, I'm talking the one with Mago Kidder and John Saxon in it. It really looks like Jason Blum and everybody at Blumhouse Pictures did not see the original Black Christmas. Because this trailer looks nothing like the original film. You know I complained about the Child's Play reboot. At least that trailer had Andy and Chucky. This Black Christmas trailer looks like it has no characters from the original Black Christmas. I'll even go and say this right now. This does not even look like a reboot a remake. Seriously, it looks like a different film with Black Christmas under its title. And to make matters worse, this trailer really sucked. I'm going to say this right now. It is bad. It is like one of the worst trailers that I have ever seen for a theatrical film. First, it doesn't excite me to see it. Well, there are trailers that aren't that exciting to see. But this gives way too much away. Seriously. I don't know what the people over at Blumhouse and Jason Blum were thinking when they released this trailer to the public. Because personally, I did not need to know that there was a killer twist involving Carrie Ells. And the fact that this film is dealing with a cult and not a single killer. I would have liked to have been surprised here, seriously, because that is something you do not give away in the trailer. It's like it commits the carnal sin of movie trailers. Never give away the film's twist. And this trailer does this recklessly. It is so stupid to the point where I don't want to see this film. I'm not going to see this film. Because now you're telling me it deals with a killer cult. Instead of a slasher. I would have liked to have known it when I went into the theater and saw the film. Not in the film's trailer. This is badly marketed. I don't know what Jason Blum and everybody else in Blumhouse thought when they saw this trailer. Because this is not a way to promote your film. By giving away the film's twist in the trailer. Now you got probably all the original Black Christmas fans upset. And completely not interested in this reboot or remake. If it's even that. Because it doesn't look like that in the film's trailer. That it is a reboot from the original Black Christmas. But it also gives too much away in the third act because there are scenes in that trailer that look like it came out of the third act of the film you never spoil the third act of the film in your trailer because if you do that this film looks predictable why would i as a consumer go to the theater put down my ten dollars or so and watch this film this is just a lazy trailer. It doesn't build any suspense. And it just looks like your average run-of-the-mill PG-13 horror film. I am not going to go see Black Christmas when it comes out in theaters. But to illustrate my point on how to make a successful trailer, I managed to find a clip from a little-known company that's probably no one has ever heard of before. In fact, this company doesn't even have a YouTube page. In fact, this company probably does not exist. Because, well, yours surely has decided to create 
a public service announcement. Yes, this is warranted of a public service announcement to all people who are creating trailers. Because, personally, the Black Christmas trailer really gives too much away, and I'm not going to go see this film on December 13th. That's a definite. But I took the time to do a public service announcement. In fact, I kind of filmed it, but lost the video, but managed to salvage the audio from it. Here it is, from Dumbhouse Pictures. Yes, the company is Dumbhouse Pictures. They create the great public service announcements. Ever want to know how to put a successful film trailer together? Here at Dumbhouse Pictures, we will show you how to put a successful film trailer. And you will be satisfied when you get millions and millions of dollars on your opening weekend. Number one, make sure you establish your characters and stars of the film. Definitely do this because people want to see characters like little Johnny as he wants characters that he can relate or be excited to see their favorite actor in their new film. Number two, make sure you have some good scenes without giving the whole entire film away. This happens with most trailers because the producer needs to show off the big scenes because while well, he does not care and wants to ruin the movie, don't do that. Do not give your film away in the trailer before it comes out because we don't want little Johnny to see the big scenes in your advertisement. We like little Johnny to beg his parents to take him to see your film and spend the 10 and 15 dollars to see your latest epic film. Number three, never under any circumstances give away the film's twist in the trailer. By doing that, your film is doomed at the box office. As now you know what is going to happen in Lil Johnny here moves on to the next film as he has felt like he has just seen the film in your trailer. Try and add in an exciting element to get your audience excited. You know, Lil Johnny is not happy that one of his favorite films is being remade or he is not sure if he wants to see your film by adding an element of excitement even if it's only a couple of seconds it makes little johnny reconsider watching your film and may entice him to get his parents to get him to take him to see your film and that means you make more money and finally number Five and most important, never add anything from the last third of the film. By doing that, you run the danger of giving your film away in the trailer completely. This ruins any surprises that you have in store for Little Johnny and everybody that is going to see your film. Here you go, all the elements that you need to make a successful trailer. Please, do the best in making the best trailer possible. Johnny, what the hell? Don't put the photo freaks in the trailer, you mother! Thank you for watching this video. Besides Anthony T's Horror Show, you can also listen to these other fine podcasts on the Doc Discussions Network. Doc Discussions, hosted by Phil Perone and Michael Darwin. You Know Nothing, Jon Snow, a Game of Thrones podcast. Bullets, Brothels, and Bots, a Westworld podcast. Halloween Boutique, Psychotronic Reviews. And searching for American Gods. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com. And Doc Discussions is also available on iTunes, 
Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Warning! The following commentary doesn't represent the views of Doc Discussions or the Doc Discussions Network. In other words, there are my views, my views only. Welcome back. Now, in more Black Christmas news, since I've already ranted about the trailer, got that out of my system, got that great PSA out there, I have to tell you about the news that recently hit about Black Christmas. The fact that the MPAA has rated Black Christmas, wait for it, wait for it, PG-13. Are you bleeping kidding me? PG bleeping 13. Come on. A slasher film never has a PG 13 rating. If you're going to do a slasher film that is PG 13, you might as well just make a TV movie. And I don't know who I'm going to start yelling at because I got a couple of people I want to rant about. But first, and you know what? I'll start with the writer of the film, April Wolf, who tweeted right after the news came out that Black Christmas will be rated PG-13, and I quote from April Wolf's tweet, Here's the deal. We wrote it with an R in mind. When they did the test screenings, it was clear that the movie needed to be available to a younger female audience, because the subject matter is timely. Also, I want to indoctrinate girls into horror. Doesn't make it less vicious. Huh? You wrote the film with an R rating in mind. But you're defending the fact that you like it. That it's PG-13. I don't get it. I really don't get it. I know that the film needed to be available to a younger female audience, but the original Black Christmas was not targeted to a younger female audience. I know you want to get young women into horror, but PG-13 horror is not going to get people into the classic horror films like The Shining, like Halloween, like... The original Black Christmas. I just don't get it. You're happy that your film got repackaged? Do you care about your story? To me, this seems like corporate talk. Yes, we're gonna... I'm proud that my film was taken apart and given a nice clean image. That is not what the horror genre is about, ladies and gentlemen. The horror genre is to push the boundaries and limits of cinema. And for hearing tweets like that, you're just doing corporate talk. That's what it is, corporate talk. You've offended the hardcore horror fans by doing this. So you're okay by trading this group of people for another group of people? I don't get it. Films have to be made accessible to everyone. Yes, Black Christmas should be an R rating. Because slasher films without an R rating usually don't work. We're not talking supernatural films. We're not talking Jaws. We're not talking Salem's Lot. We're talking slasher films. And in a slasher film, you need blood for the film to work. And you're proud that your remake is bloodless and it's going to expose this new generation to horror. Because if you're exposing people to a PG-13 horror slasher, then you're not exposing them to horror. You're pretty much exposing them to a TV movie of the week. Because everything is toned down to the point where it's just boring. There's no... S- sense of scare factor. It's just a watered down version of the original vision. That's all I'm going to say about this. Because I'm going to now move on to Blumhouse and yes, Jason Blum for doing this. 
because thank you, Jason Blum. You just ruined a classic horror film by making it PG-13. Let me tell you about PG-13 slasher films. These are slasher films that have little or no blood to them. By not having the key element of blood in a slasher film, it's pretty much useless, ladies and gentlemen. It's a useless and boring film because there is no suspense. The stakes don't feel high and you're not scared. It's just, I don't really get why they made this film PG-13. Sure, I guess you wanted to do it again since you did it well with Happy Death Day. But Happy Death Day, for the most part, plays like a comedy as well. So it can probably get away without the blood and everything. But to have a straightforward slasher film have a PG-13 rating is a crime. It is not needed in the horror genre. We need to go back to the 80s slasher films. Films like The Mutilator, the Friday the 13th films, the Nightmare on Elm Street films, where you had blood, you had intensity, and you were scared. These PG-13 horror films are very rarely scary. The only ones that really are scary are the paranormal films, or films that deal with the supernatural and ghosts. Not slasher films, because slasher films needs to be an R. A hard R. This is why I love films like the Hatchet series. This is why I love the Bond a lot. Hell, I love Terrifier a lot, because it feels like a slasher film. This Black Christmas remake is going to be light on the blood and catering towards an audience that does not understand the original film. Come on. Is it hard for these studios to give what us horror fans want? We want hot horror, bloody horror. Not PG-13. Not PG. Rated R. You can do it by adding a lot of blood. And it seems like Blumhouse is so afraid that it won't make money that it needs to have a scaled down version of Black Christmas to which the hardcore horror fans will not support. Because I've said in the trailer it's already obvious that it's not like that. But to throw in some occult plot line and try to cater to people who have not seen the original film or can't see the original film. It's a disservice to the fans of the original Black Christmas. Seriously, by making this film PG-13, they've chosen to make this film so accessible to everybody that they've ignored the fact about the original Black Christmas. Because the original Black Christmas wasn't PG-13, it was rated R. And for a reason. I don't know why the studios can't cater to us horror fans. We will support great horror films. I know we didn't show up for Doctor Sleep, which still baffles me why that bombed at the box office because I really thought that was going to do well at the box office. But how is it hard to make a 10 or 15 million dollar rated R horror film? You probably can make your money back easily if you made a 10 to 15 million dollar rated R horror film. And to the studio that's put out the last Halloween film and the Purge series, why are you making Black Christmas so accessible to everybody, turning off the horror fan base in hopes that you can find new viewers. Because the target audience for this Black Christmas isn't for us horror fans, that's for sure. Because it seems like Jason Blum and Blumhouse are concerned about making money off of people who have never seen the original Black Christmas. Make a film that is accessible to everyone, not for teenagers. 
as you're doing with this remake of Black Christmas. This has been a disaster. Seriously. This film was shot quick, plus this film was edited to the point that, oh, 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 we can't, we can't put out the rated R version because we need to target it towards a demographic. I don't get major studios. Seriously. Everything has to be targeted towards a specific demographic. And this is what's hurting horror, and this is what's hurting the box office overall. Because we're all trying to cater to one demographic instead of catering to everybody. Enough with this Jason Blum rants. I'm done talking about Jason Blum, hopefully until 2020. Because I do not want to mention Jason Blum again until 2020. Because... This is ridiculous that Jason Blum has ruined a classic horror film. Every day there's a family struggling with hospital bills to care for their sick child who is fighting an illness. There's a woman who is fighting breast cancer and is having trouble making ends meet while paying for their treatment. And there are burn victims that are going through treatments to heal their deep wounds. There is a charity in the horror community that helps these people. Scares That Care is an organization that helps families deal with the bills for their child. They help women get the treatment they need to fight breast cancer. And they help people who are dealing with severe burns get the help they need to heal. Scares That Care is a 100% volunteer organization and 501c3 nonprofit charity that is dedicated to helping these people in fighting real monsters. To find out more information or to donate to Scares That Care, you can go to www.scaresthatcare.org. Every donation helps Scares That Care fight real monsters. Hey guys, this is Steven Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic-Con coverage all around? Well then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributor. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. Welcome back to Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm here with my guest, Damon Della Greca. He is the founder and developer of the Slasher app, which can be found on your Android and iPhones. How are you doing today, Damon? Hey, good. How's it going? Doing very good. Cool. For what made you a horror fan? Um. <clears throat> So when I was a kid, I was always into um, like sci-fi and fantasy and that kind of stuff. And I, I think it was just the idea of things that aren't real becoming real on the screen. Um, you know, things that seemed impossible. Or it was just fascinating to me. Um, so I guess, you know, having really enjoyed sci-fi and fantasy and all that kind of stuff, it was sort of a natural progression because, you know, there's a lot of makeup and special effects in horror. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it kind of, a lot of the same elements sort of cross over. So I think that was really it. Now, what are some of your favorite films that you enjoy the most? Um, Poltergeist is definitely one that stands out because that's like the first one that I had seen. So I was like... I don't know, eight years old, roughly, when I was watching it on cable one day. And to see that, you know, all these ghosts and, and like, the tree and everything was going after these kids, I was like, holy crap, that's crazy. So it was such a rush just watching that, and that was it. I was hooked, you know. Um, aside from that, oh, man, there's so many good ones out there. Um, I watched, what was it, uh... I could I could probably tell you stuff I watched more recently that I liked than anything else. So I watched Nightmare Cinema the other night, um, and that was actually pretty good. It was a little different. Um, I liked the way it was made, so that was um, that was a, a good one. Um, I remember watching like Nine Seven Six Evil as a kid, um, Toxic Avenger, um, and then the, the the I guess the the little monster type movies like. Um, like you'd find in uh, House or Critters and Ghoulies and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that, that stuff I always found fun. Uh, Puppet Master, 
you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, the Puppet Master is one of the films that I grew up with as well, constantly seeing it on Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Now, you recently released a new app called Slasher, which is, I think, a very good social media platform, which is available now on the Android and iPhones, mm -hmm. which the show here has a page for. It serves as both my personal and the official page for the podcast. How did the idea for the app come about? Um, so what I did was, I had been going to conventions for a while, and, you know, I noticed that a lot of my friends who were vendors would be talking about a show that they did, like, the weekend before, one that they were going to do in, in, like, another week or two, and I hadn't heard about them other than at that time, so it was too late for me to be able to, to book them. So what I would do is I would be, like, you know, getting totally lost in, you know, where the conventions are happening, when they're happening, so... What I did was I put together a calendar, <clears throat> basically just for my friends and I, and it was something that we, you know, I put together and said, hey, you know, here's uh, here's something going on in Massachusetts, or here's something going on in, like, Rhode Island or something. You guys want to go? So, you know, some of us would get together, and we'd, we'd go to these things, and, um, you know, it, it just kind of grew from there, because I would think more and more about, okay, so there there. are missing pieces to this puzzle you know um what what am what am i missing here what are other people missing because now that you know i i've, I've got the piece for the events and, and i know when all the conventions are um what else could we do and it just sort of grew from there i started putting an outline together for every single aspect i could think of that myself and potentially other people were missing and it, it just kind of it, it became an outline then it became like a plan and then next thing i know i was in development what was the process like in creating this app from inception to the finished product um it was pretty generally it was pretty straightforward um i i had clear ideas and it was really a matter of okay so i know what i want to accomplish now it's a matter of just making them work making all these things happen so you know i took the outlines and i would bring them to um you know some some developers and stuff and say okay here's what i want to do um what are we looking at here as far as what kind of time do we need what kind of resources do we need um and you know it, it just it just started <laughs> I, I was I was neck deep in it before I even realized what happened, um, and now you know here we are. We've already got version two plus another couple of updates out, more on the way, and um, you know it, it, <laughs> it, it's just kind of like, oh, this is out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> How long did it take to create the app? Um, version one was so like three to four months. Um, we started in March for version one, and then it came out in June. So somewhere between, yeah, somewhere between that. And then um, basically that um, that turned out to be really sort of a test to see, okay, what, what are my ideas going to do here? Like I, I had some specific ideas. I wanted to try and break out of, um, you know, the traditional social network constructs that that are out there and the way that they're designed, um, even bringing back some stuff from the 90s um, in some of this, which is still kind of relevant today. Uh, it, it just has to be revamped a little bit, like the live chat, for example. Um, but, um, you know, that that was really the testing ground. That was what I was using to figure out what's going to work, what's not going to work, and what do people really want? Um, what are they going to enjoy? So while so once once it launched in June, it was all about you know staying on top of things, making sure that I was listening to everybody um, and taking all the feedback and seeing what people were doing, <clears throat> and then bringing that together for 2.0. And that's that's kind of where we are now. Is I've taken all the the feedback and the suggestions and everything, and even if they're not on there yet, um, there's a lot that's still on the way that, um, you know, it's just a matter of prioritizing things. So if it's not on there, it probably will be. <laughs> <laughs> now, what social media platforms influenced the Slasher app? Um, 
I would say, <clears throat> well, I mean, Facebook obviously is a big one because that's where people go to communicate. So I tried to take all the, the best elements of that and incorporate them. Um, and then, you know, Instagram has its own features. So I, I tried to bring some of those in as well. Um, that's, that's primarily it. Um, you know, I, I really just tried to say, okay, what's, what's useful? What are people going to enjoy and benefit from? Um, and then just try to put it together in the simplest way that I could, you know, think of at the time, which, you know, things are always changing and evolving. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it's easy to adjust things and, and improve them as time goes on because you see how people are using them or if, if people are having trouble um, or if something isn't making sense. Um, so it's easy to go in and tweak things and say, okay, so we need to adjust this because it at this point doesn't make any sense or isn't working the way we hoped. So let's make this adjustment and make it easier for people or make it better somehow. Were there any challenges or setbacks while developing the Slasher app? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest challenge was, I think, figuring out how to work most efficiently and prioritize things. Um, that was, that was a big challenge. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it was a matter of, okay, well, you know, we have to get X, Y, and Z done. Um, when is this going to be done? Let's get it done on time because, you know, whatever you say, I have to make sure that, you know, I'm promoting. So basically if the, the team told me, you know, something is going to be done by a certain time, it's like, all right, well, I, I hope you, <laughs> I hope you accounted for a little bit extra time just in case. Um, because what I find is, <clears throat> um, very rarely do I, say, okay, let's release something um, without a feature or two. Um, I mean, I have had to do it with 2.0, but <clears throat> but from this point on, any new features that I'm coming out with, you know, if, if I have ideas for them, I'm trying to get everything in there the first shot because, you know, I, I don't want people to think that it's lacking or <clears throat> that, you know, if they try it once and don't see a particular functionality, that they expect or that they want that, okay, even though it may be coming in a week, sometimes people just abandon things because it's not there. And it's like, well, that's that. But generally with me, that's not the case because I'm always working to add things and improve things and build um, and always listening. Always, always, always listening. That's really important. The app also has some unique niches to it, which makes it a little different from Facebook. Mm hmm what are some of the features that people can find on the app besides the regular timeline? Um, the biggest feature is going to be that it's it's a rated R app for uh, for us. You know, um, it's it's not something where you know if, if you post something like a picture that's gory or something like that, or even if you post a picture of like you know a scene from a movie that there happens to be nudity in. Well, look, if it's a horror movie or if it's in context or whatever, it's fine. Um, I mean, this is designed for adults. It's it's not designed for kids. So we should be able to enjoy ourselves without the constraints that, you know, mainstream social media is putting on us. I think a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who are filmmakers in this genre, um, you know, they've, they've seen firsthand um, what it's like to be censored or to have your accounts shut down, um, you know, after you put a lot of time and effort into working towards building a following and, you know, utilizing their platforms. And frankly, they, these other platforms have made money on all these people and they just turned around and shut them down. I, I just don't think that's right. Um, you know, because you could go on to some of these things and <laughs> find straight up porn. And meanwhile, some horror stuff, it, it just, you know, it, it gets shut down. doesn't make sense. So to me, that is the biggest feature. Even though it's not a, a, a function, <laughs> it's 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 a feature um, because you know we can talk about things, we can enjoy ourselves, and not have to look over our shoulder. Um, you know, like the <laughs> the social media big bad is behind us, ready to censor, drop the band hammer. <laughs> now, there's also some other features on the app which I like, like groups, events calendar, podcasts, mm -hmm. and other stuff. 
What made you want to include those features as well on your app? That's a good question. Um, well, the groups, it's... You know, I saw, you know, how Facebook was doing things, and that was one of the things that was sort of like a throwback to, like, the, the 90s, um, was, you know, the, the concept of message boards um, was, was still pretty much there. Um, so it really kind of went to that, to say, okay, well, <clears throat> we've got these general categories where you can go and have conversations that fall within those, but it's it's not like Facebook where you go in there and you're just dumped into a conversation at random because, you know, you have all these different posts that are totally different conversations. Well, at least here, you know, you've got a topic. You've got your category, like movies, for example, movies and TV. And then within that, you can create a topic that has a subject. So that way you'll know what you're getting yourself into without having to spend time reading the post. You know, you can kind of get the, the idea real quick and um, and not waste a whole lot of time. How has the reception for the app been so far? Um, it's generally been terrific. Um, anybody who is actively using it has, has really had some fantastic things to say. Um, and, and I'm really, really happy whenever I hear somebody say something that is just like... Uh, for example, I had a couple of people... Um, messaging with me and telling me that they were basically going to stop using, um, like, you know, the mainstream social media stuff for a while because they needed to take a break. Um, and I get that. It, it, it can be, it can be stressful. Um, it could be aggravating. But the thing that really got me was when, um, when they told me that they were going to keep using Slasher because they didn't see it the same way. It wasn't affecting their lives in that way. And it was affecting them in a positive way. So hearing things like that is amazing to me. Um, and I, it just makes me really happy and thankful to, to have such, you know, such nice people, you know, people who just want to enjoy themselves, do their thing, you know, have fun and, you know, but just have a great time at it. Can you view your slasher feed on the web, or is that just on your phone at the moment? It's just on the uh, the mobile app at the moment. Um, I may be porting some other things over. Like the only thing that's on the website that is on both is the events calendar. Um, but eventually, I'm looking to port some other things over to the web. I also noticed that you have a Patreon for Slasher as well. Why did you set a Patreon for the app? Um, well, quite honestly, um, you know, this is a very, very costly thing to do. Um, and I don't have ads on the app. There's no banners or anything like that. Um, there's, at the moment, there's no, you know, way to help pay for it through the app itself. So I set that up to do a couple of things. One is to, you know, hope that I could get some people who appreciate what I'm doing, um, see the value and the benefits, and would, would be kind enough to contribute to this cause. Um, you know, there's a lot that I'm looking to do to support the, um, the indie community as far as filmmakers, podcasters, um, you know, like you mentioned before, there's the podcast section. Well, I want to do something different. Um, I'm going I want to make that grow. So that way it's easier for guys like you to get out there and get in front of people, um, and, and be able to promote your stuff right in front of your primary audience. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that people will, um, will see the, the value here and decide that, you know, this is something that's worth contributing to is not only the growth of this community, um, in horror, but also towards what may potentially lead to the growth of artists, which would be, you know, filmmakers, writers, um, you know, all, all different kinds of people, um, who are, you know, creative and making anything. So, uh, you know, that's that's really one of my big goals. And like I said, I'm, I'm just hoping that people see the, the benefit to that and are, are willing to do what they can to contribute. Um, it is certainly appreciated, and it goes straight into the development and maintenance of the app. What rewards can people get when they back your Patreon? There's a bunch of them. Um, I just added... A whole bunch of new ones and made things a little bit simpler so I know let's see I know I did something here 
where um, at a certain point, people can get um, beta previews of the Android version of the app. So if people want to see what's going on, um, if you contribute at a certain level, which is, I think, I don't know, five bucks or something like that, um, you can get a, um, a beta preview um, of, of the app, and you can check it out and see what's new, what's going on, check out the new features. Um, there's, uh, there's stickers, there's um, an enamel pin... There's a pop socket. Um, there's we're going to be doing posters, T-shirts. Um, <laughs> the the craziest one I have on there, just for the sake of having something crazy, quite frankly, was um, at a certain level. Um, I am willing to give the iPhone that I used to test the app during development, and I still use it. So from from March till now, it's it's basically the iPhone <laughs> that I've used. To um to do all the um the alpha and beta testing and um yeah that, I figured that would be kind of maybe like an interesting little collector's item for somebody I mean who knows <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was kind of fun. Where can they find this Patreon page for Slasher? Sure. So the Patreon page is let's see it's a good question because I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um. It's patreon.com slash the slasher app. Any plans to add new features to the app oh. in the future? <laughs> always. There are always new features coming. Um, as long as I'm breathing, there will probably be a new feature on the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, what we're working on right now is um, is actually pretty substantial. Um, we're revamping the movies section, and what it's going to offer is you'll have a, a database of over 10,000 horror movies that you can um, that you can check out trailers for that you can um, you know comment on or give ratings to um, you can add them to a favorites list a watch list or a watched list like you've already seen it um, something that you want to watch uh, and a buy list so that way you can keep track of you know what what you've seen, what you want to see, what you want to buy, and um, and just make things a lot easier. Um, you'll also be able to share those lists with your friends, um, both on and off the app, um, and uh, and just you know talk about these movies, talk about what um, you know what you like, and share things that maybe people haven't seen before or haven't even heard of. Um, so that's coming hopefully. Within a week or so. Um, so there's that. Um, sort of a second part to that is any indie filmmaker will be able to get a listing just like that um, with what we're doing with the mainstream movies. So, you know, it, it's it's going to be a separate category. So you go to the movie section and you'll see mainstream and then you'll see indie. So what we're going to do is so we're going to keep indie separate so that way you know, the indie films don't get lost in the mix, um, you know, because I, I want these people to stand out. There's a lot of fantastic filmmakers out there that need to be recognized, um, that need to have their, their work seen more easily. So, um, you know, this is something that I'm working toward um, as far as helping them out and, you know, helping to get them out there a little bit further than, you know, some of the film festivals and stuff like that and having to go to conventions to, you know, to have anybody know who they are. It's difficult, so um, I think this is going to be a terrific way to help um, indie filmmakers. Um, there's going to be something similar for podcasts coming out. Um, there's going to be a feature where you know you'll be able to get um, a listing. Um, you'll be able to have all of your episodes stream right through the app itself. Um, people will be able to give your podcasts ratings. Um, you'll be able to talk about them be able to talk about the episodes. So you'll have a lot of opportunity to interact with listeners um, and find out, you know, what they like, what they don't like, and constantly, you know, keep keep making yourselves better, um, improving where you need to, um, and, and keeping on track with the stuff that's already great. Um, you know, I personally, I always want to hear what people don't like about my stuff. So it's like, okay, just, you know, it's... The good stuff, yeah, it's it's nice. I'm glad you like the good stuff, but tell me what you hate, you know. 
Tell me what you absolutely can't stand, because that's the kind of stuff I want to improve. So that way, I've got a solid foundation, and I can just keep building up from there. So I, I tried to put that kind of thinking into things, so that way, you know, people can always strive to, to be the best that they can. There's a lot of great people out there. I want to see them succeed. Now, where can they contact you if they have a problem with your app? Okay, two ways. You could send me a message right on the app, um, or you could just send an email to help at slasher.tv. Um, I am always paying attention to this kind of stuff, and I'm always trying to do whatever I can to help people, make things easier, um, you know, take feedback about, you know, uh, new features that people may want, and things like that. Um, I try and really stay on top of all that kind of stuff. Now, where can they find Slasher on the web and various social media platforms? So the website is uh, slasher.tv, and then all the social medias is uh, at the Slasher app. Well, Damon, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. Good luck on the continuing success of your app, Slasher. And have a good day. Thanks, Anthony. I really appreciate that. It was great talking with you. Want to learn more about horror directors? With a lighthearted look at three of their movies? Meet fearless podcaster Gore Blimey. I've been unsettled by bats in the past and startled by parrots, and I've even been known to jump at the odd cockatoo. Discover horror films that are classics and others, too. There's a topless aerobics massacre, an exploding rock singer, cannibals, nude martial arts, a deep fried frost. But it's not all silliness. You'll get proper movie breakdowns, opinion, and background information too. Yep, in the 80s and 90s, Jeff Stryker was huge in gay porn. In every sense. So if you're a horror film fan, come and check out the Trilogy of Terror podcast at strangeanddeadly.com or find it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or on your podcatcher one of those people that has a certain charisma and a certain style and I'm just hoping one day he'll rub off on me the trilogy of terror podcast where we try three times harder to give you the willies for the latest news and information on Anthony G's Horror Show you can check out Anthony G's Horror Show on the social media platforms at Anthony G's Horror Show on Facebook Instagram in the Slasher app, at Anthony Keys Horror on Twitter. Anthony Keys Horror Show can be found on YouTube as well, at youtube.com slash Anthony Thurber. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com. And you can find Anthony Keys Horror Show on the web at anthonykeyshorrorshow.blogspot.com. For my film recommendation this episode, since I almost spent half the show talking about a PG-13 slasher, which yours truly will not be seeing, I decided why not recommend a slasher film. But wait, it's not only a slasher film, it's also a found footage film. It's a very twisted film. I'm talking about Dread's release of There Inside. Now, this film was released back in July, but I haven't had a chance to see this film until most recently. This is a very twisted film, and I really liked this film a lot, and it's definitely on consideration for my top 10 of 2019, as one of the things I loved about There Inside was John Paul Pinelli's direction, as he does a very good job making sure everything moved at a very good pace, Considering the film is a found footage film, and considering the fact that it has a kind of dreadful tone and creepy tone throughout, he does a really good job directing his cast, as I was really into the performances. The film has a couple of really good performances in it, from actresses Carly Hall and Amanda Kathleen Ward. Both of those actresses did a great job with the way that they approached their characters. I also like the chemistry between the two actresses in the film. As the both of them really did a good job working off of each other. As they both had very good chemistry as sisters in the film. The other thing that I really liked about this film was the screenplay. 
This film is very twisted from start to finish. Most of it has to do with the fact that this film takes a turn near the end of the film, which you don't see coming. Plus, it really does a great job playing off all the slasher and all the found footage aspects. It made me really interested in the film's story, which really goes by quick, as this is an 83-minute film. I also like how the film has a really unique feel to it, as this has an avant-garde feel to it, as this film is shot from the point of view of the killers and from the main characters. I thought it was kind of neat to have different points of view, which helped made the film's shocking ending work, as I did not expect the film to end the way it did. But it is... One of those shocking slasher found footage films that people should check out. There Inside is currently available on Blu-ray from Epic Pictures. And available on VOD at various VOD platforms. Definitely check out There Inside. As this is a great film if you love slashers and found footage films. As they're both rolled into one film. And this is why There Inside is my Film recommendation this episode. Over on the official website of Anthony T's Horror Show, I recently reviewed the Blu-ray for Troma's latest release, Return to Return to Nukem High. Yes, I did a video review of the film last year, but decided to also do the Blu-ray because this Blu-ray is loaded with extras. You'll get my thoughts on the film again, as I saw this film differently, as I saw this film pretty much as is. Instead of it being two parts, I just saw a part two. You'll get my thoughts on the film. See if I've changed my mind on the film. Over on the YouTube channel, I've decided to hold off on get putting more content on there. Because I don't know what's going on with this YouTube controversy that's been out there. So I decided to, at the moment... Just put the podcast on the YouTube channel. Once this gets straight out after December 10th or so, I'll probably do another edition of Anthony T's Horror Collection. If my channel's still there, obviously. If it's not, then we're just getting the podcast. Because I don't know of any other video hosting sites that are free. So... If the YouTube channel is still there after December 10th, I will begin filming another edition of Anthony T's Horror Collection, as I haven't done one in a while. With that, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Anthony T's Horror Show. Don't forget to like the show on Facebook, Instagram at Anthony T's Horror Show, on Twitter at Anthony T's Horror, and if you have a question over on Twitter, I'm doing Ask Anthony T anything could be what films I like could be whatever you want to ask or if you have comments about the show please go to twitter.com slash Anthony T's horror make sure you use the hashtag ask Anthony T and also tag Anthony T's horror so I know you sent the tweet and I will get back to you on a future episode of Anthony T's horror show with that I hope you enjoyed this episode have a good day and support indie horror